Okay. Um, so next uh, for this afternoon, uh, Franck Denis uh, from a, a, a not not so famous French ISP. Um, and uh, so not, not only is it interesting that uh, someone from a, a big uh, web hosting company talks, but uh, the content of his presentation is really interesting. Uh, you, you'll see that uh, uh, they're doing uh, interesting work uh, at OVH on, uh, on the subject of threat intelligence. And uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, listening to you, Frank. Uh, you want this mic? Yep. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, Modconf. How's it going so far? Good? Oh, how's, how's it going so far? That's better. <laughs> All right, so this is a talk about something which is missing in threat intelligence, as well as a proposal to fix it. So, who's that guy? Well, my name's Roy Nice. I work at OVH. My day job is to find bad stuff on the OVH network. And I also do a bunch of stuff if you're into crypto, into big data security, feel free to check out my GitHub and Twitter accounts. So if you've never heard about OVH, OVH is the largest ISP in Europe. We build and operate 17 data centers, more coming up soon. We manage quite a lot of domain names as well. We are the second registrar in Europe. We provide a bunch of services, such as enterprise telephony, connectivity, uh, cloud services, dedicated servers. This is the main thing we do, VPS. And maybe you know OVH under a different name, because we have quite a few resellers as well. All right, so back to the topic. What is threat intelligence? Well, for some people, it just feeds. RSS, not so much, but feeds, yeah, why not? Well, actually, it's probably more interesting if you give more context, if you try to understand what's going on, who, where, why, how. Still, for a lot of people, this is what really matters. Just give me a bunch of malicious IPs, a bunch of malicious domain names, and maybe just some signatures or some rules for my IDS or my product. Why? Well, why are we doing that? Well, the thing is, we do all these things just for defense. We want to prevent some bad stuff from infecting network, enterprise network, private networks, toothbrushes, everything. So really what matters is this, and then you can just use this list of malicious IPs and domains to enforce some rules. All right, so I joined OVH just a couple months ago, and I was like, all right, cool, where do I start now? Well, what I did is pretty obvious. I just retrieved a bunch of public and private feeds of malicious IPs, and I was looking for matches on the OVH subnet. And in order to do so, I used Combine. So if you never heard about Combine, this is a great tool. Check it out, it's on GitHub. So basically, Combine retrieves a bunch of feeds, and then it's going to add some extra information. It's going to normalize everything, combine everything, and what you're gonna get is just a JSON file and a CSV file that you can use very easily. So I just used Combine with about 40 different feeds, and what I found is about 10,000 IPs on the OVH network. I was like, what? That's quite a lot. Well, the thing is, most of them were just scans and some over zealous vendors blocking some nets as soon as they see more than two IPs having performed a scan. So we had whole slash 24 being blocked, which is pretty bad. So we already have a bunch of very specific models to deal with spam and scans and DDoS. So I really wanted to focus on one, one thing, which is malware. So I just filtered out a bunch of things that I wasn't really interested in. And what I found was a bit more than 700 IPs 
in this list. So I was like, eh, still a lot. Well, now what should I do? Review everything one by one. This is what I did. It's really painful, it's tedious, it's long. But this is what I did. And I found about 17 IPs for which I, I, I had evidence that they were malicious, something, something right now, or they used to serve something malicious not so long ago. I had some fingerprints that I could recognize. So, okay, they could be nuked right away, which was great. What about everything else? Well, for most of them, I couldn't find any evidence. And you know what? When all you have is an IP address and you're trying to get some intelligence about it, and all you see is either nothing or suspicious, malicious, well, you can look for the usual suspect. If you don't find anything, as an ISP, there's absolutely nothing I can do with these IPs. Nothing I can do with most of the feeds. I don't have any context. I don't know what I'm looking for. I'm not going to take down a customer account just because some guy said, hey, I think it's suspicious. I don't know why. Maybe you should block it or just take it down. Nope, I can't do anything. So that's a bit annoying. And I found a bunch of IPs uh, that had been taken down sometimes a long time ago and that just popped up. And it's interesting, some feeds have some slight delay, like they always have 40 hours delay so that they're blocking something that happened the day before, which is sometimes not very effective. Uh, compromised servers, so this is happening a lot. But sometimes people actually reinstall their servers. Sometimes it's probably clean, but still, these IPs stay for a long time in most block lists. IPs reassigned to completely different customers, still being blocked for a while. IPs that have never been assigned, maybe typos or just over those people, blacklisting slash 24. And some IPs that we recently acquired from different companies as well. It's interesting. False positives, especially for phishing. So I'm going to show a pretty interesting example soon. Sinkholes. So yeah, if you sell a security product, should you block sinkholes? Well, my take is that if you do so, you're just being an asshole with other researchers from which you're probably retrieving and monetizing intelligence from. So don't block sinkholes. These sinkholes are not malicious per se. So don't block sinkholes. VPN, Tor, proxies. Well, OK, VPN, Tor, they're used a lot by bad guys to like perform scans and look for weak SSH passwords and some common WordPress plugins. That's true. But the thing is, if you take down a Tor exit node or a VPN exit node, well, people just running scripts don't care. The scripts are going to be just slightly slower, but they don't really care. You're just going to hurt real legitimate people who actually need Tor. So it's completely useless to take down Tor exit nodes. Tor is still working. You're just going to take a different path. Well, still, on a bunch of servers running Tor exit nodes, we see some different kind of badness. So in this case, it makes sense to completely take down the server. But just because this is a Tor IP and you saw that in your IDS logs, it's not worth blocking. CDNs, load balancers, and cloud services. So what is cloud services? Well, basically, you can just rent an IP and a server for a couple of minutes, hours, days, weeks, and then you just dispose it. So behind a single IP, you're going to have a lot of customers completely unrelated customers. So if you choose to block something because you saw some malicious activity coming from an IP, which is on a CDN or a cloud service, it's not really useful. You're just blocking legitimate customers. And the real thing you were after is probably somewhere else. So I just note about OVH. Well, this is a bunch of interesting IPs that used to be blocked a couple of days ago. And the thing is, all of these are actually Cloudflare. So sure, these IPs were probably observed in IDS logs because of some malicious activity. But still, behind all, all of these IPs, there's a lot of completely legitimate websites. And if you block one of these IPs, maybe what you're looking for is using something else. 
And especially Cloudflare, they use two different IPs per domain. So if you block just one, you're not going to do anything. You're just hurting legitimate websites and that's it. Well, the thing is, everybody knows about Cloudflare. But you know, CDNs, there are many of them. Cloud services, shared infrastructures, there are tons of them. How can you know how many people are behind a single IP? Well, you can't, not easily, right? This is an e-commerce website. It's called eStyle. They sell electronics. It's a great site, completely legitimate. And the thing is, today, a bunch of security products are going to flag this as malicious. Don't go there. Why? How come? Well, as an ISP, this is a reason which is not enough. But this is actually why it's blocked. Because on VirusTotal, the detection ratio is not zero. And some products are just like, OK, it's not zero. There's a bunch of hits on VT. So let's block it. So yeah, in 2013, it used to be a dodge jumper CNC. Dodge jumper is a DDoS bot. So yeah, it was quite a long time ago, right? Still, if you don't pay attention to the date, and a lot of products don't, that just look at the ratio, this thing is going to be blocked. This is the truth. This is what I see. We had a customer from May 2013 to January 2014. And yeah, it was a pretty suspicious guy. And then this specific IP was completely unassigned for a while. And on October 15, 2014, it was assigned to a completely different customer, which is totally legitimate as far as I know. This is some interesting information. However, nobody has it except maybe the ISP. This is a different example. This is a mod. This is a pretty cool game. You can play it using Telnet or online with Flash or HTML5. It's quite fun. It's legitimate. But the thing is, a bunch of vendors are blocking it. Why? Because two years ago, a nuclear exploit kit was seen on this IP. And you know, exploit kits tend to use a lot of different host names and domain names. And if you just block specific Domain names, it's completely useless. By the time you actually block the domain name, it's already using something else. So all you can block is actually the name servers, sometimes, or the IP. But the thing is, you don't really know how long it's still suspicious. Well, you can take a look at DNS records, but it's not enough. And what I saw is that actually this specific IP was taken down the day after Nuclear was live on this IP completely uh, unassigned until January 2015, and then reassigned to somebody else. So yeah, the problem is when you see something malicious, how long should you keep it blocked? How long is it malicious? Hard to tell. If you don't see anything anymore, like, OK, I don't see any DNS uh, names mapping to this IP anymore, what does it mean? It just means that you don't see anything anymore. Maybe there's something else going on. You're just not aware of it. Maybe there's nothing going on, but it's the same actor behind this IP, and it's going to do something else pretty soon. So you don't know. That's a hint. Maybe the ISP knows. So what most people do is assign some random TTL. Every time I see something malicious, let's keep it for three months. Well. Maybe it's not enough. Maybe it's still malicious. Maybe it's too much. And you're preventing your own employees from accessing legitimate websites. They need to work. It's hard to tell. If you just assign some random TTL, eh, it doesn't work really well. Or, and this is usually the case for phishing, you can monitor specific URLs and see if you get a 404. But the thing is, uh, when you know about one specific phishing URL, well, there's a ton of other URLs on the same server. So if you don't see one anymore, it returns a 404. It doesn't mean that there's not a live phishing campaign, which is still going on on the same server. And what we frequently observe is that on the same server, you have multiple campaigns running at the same time. So if you don't see one anymore, you can be sure that you're not missing something. Forever, that's a different strategy. Some vendors are doing that. Or until a customer complains. And that's actually pretty interesting, because 
when someone stumbles upon something, a website or a file, and the AV says, hey, it's malicious. Well, people usually don't complain. This is the first thing they do, nothing. The second thing they do is they're going to complain to whoever wrote the software or operates the website, saying, hey, your thing is malicious. Well, and this person is probably not going to care. Maybe they're going to tell the ISP. The ISP doesn't have time to get in touch with AV vendors and security products vendors to tell, hey, my customers, blah, 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 maybe it's not malicious. No. And really, getting in touch with the security vendor is the very last thing people do, if only because they might not speak your language. How often do you get complaints about false positives from people in China if you're a US company? Well, not so much, because people might not speak your language, and they don't even know how to get in touch with you. But ISPs know a bit more. They can get some complaints that you don't get. But same, still, your security product vendor, you get a request, and there's a person saying, hey, this is my website. It used to be compromised. Now it's clean. I swear it's clean. Trust me. Are you going to trust him? Why? OK, this is a big customer. There's a lot of traffic on this domain. Uh, OK, let's whitelist it. It's a bit like rolling the dice, right? But it's really tricky. You need more context. You don't know if it's safe anymore. Maybe the ISP knows. The ISP can tell you, hey, this machine was completely reinstalled. So it's more likely to be clean now. So if you get a sample today, or just a signature for it, and you know it's malicious, it's obvious, you run it, OK, it's a banking trojan, it's malicious. If you come across the same signature in a couple of years, well, it's still malicious. If you see that on your network, well, some device has been compromised. It's obvious. So it's always real man. But what about IPs, domain names, even emails? They have a cycle of life. They can be malicious for a given time period, and then totally clean. So if you have this kind of indicators, it's really critical to have a time window. So this is a phishing web page. We got this report from a company doing a great, great job at spotting phishing, amazing job. And we got this website, and they were like, hey, it's a phishing. All right, so BNP Paribas is a bank. OK, you can see on the host name, there is BNP. All right. It says login password. OK, it's probably a fish, right? Well, if you happen to be French, not only to speak French, but to be French, you might notice something. It says CE, which stands for Committed Entreprise. This is a website by employees for employees to discuss the company benefits. So if you happen to be French, you're going to be like, huh, let me double check. So same thing. Sometimes you come across something like a domain name that looks like a DGA. You're not sure. It's not part of a cluster, but there's a lot of digits. It's weird. Maybe you can ask somebody who can speak Mandarin, and this person's going to tell you, hey, it sounds like some very common Mandarin word, and it's a way to write this Mandarin word using Latin character. So maybe it's not a it's not something malicious. Maybe it's a false positive. Double check. So who can help you with that? Well, maybe a local ISP can help. A French ISP can tell you, hey, maybe this is legitimate, because I understand French and the French culture. Maybe a Chinese ISP can tell you this is not a DGA. And also, ISP can talk to their customers. Like you see a domain name with a ton of host names. What is it? Well, ain't no way you're going to ask directly the website owner. It's a bit weird. But the ISP can. Life rate, the indicators of compromise. <coughs> so let's say you see uh, a C2 today. It's active. It's a C2. And then this C2 gets taken down. And a couple of months later, you see some traffic on your network going to this C2. It's still weird. Maybe some of your devices got compromised. 
even if this C2 is not active anymore, it's still a sign that, hmm, something happened. Same thing, if you know that this specific domain name is serving a payload, like you get a Drydex payload, not the downloader, but the payload itself, and after a while, this payload is not served anymore, but still, you see some traffic going to it. That's real. Maybe, still, one of your machines got infected. So you should block them, uh, unless it's GitHub or Dropbox. You're not gonna block Dropbox, even if Dropbox is hosting a payload or get them, or something you know. But what if it's something in Russian that you don't understand? Uh, maybe I'm gonna block it. Well, a better thing to do would be maybe to use different indicators, add specific URLs, signatures, patterns, at least port numbers, something less generic. What about compromised websites? So this is a story of a big website there's a lot of people going to it, it's totally legitimate, and it got compromised. So now there's an iframe and a redirect to an exploit kit. Well, this is a story we hear pretty much every single week. That's pretty sad. But still, you're not gonna have blocked like the Reader's Digest forever. They got compromised and then, presumably, they're safe. But you don't know exactly when. Still, if you see traffic going to this website after they've been cleaned, there's no reason to block them. Compromised domains. So this is a story about a guy. He has a lot of domain names registered at the registrar. Let's call it GoMummy. And his GoMummy account gets compromised. And bad guys use the GoMummy API to register host names and these host names are used by exploit kits. Well, after a while, maybe this guy is gonna realize, oops, I was pwned. I'm gonna change my password, migrate to a different registrar, and maybe the domain name itself is totally safe now. There's no reason to block it anymore. Landing pages. I'm really into exploit kits, sorry for that. So a landing page is usually uh, using a lot of Ephemeral host names, tons of host names, everybody gets a different one, so that's cool. And you never go to these pages intentionally. You get a redirect, some mal malvertising or a compromised website, you never go to this web page directly by yourself. So after an IP having been observed to serve an exploit, uh, an exploit kit landing page has been taken down and then reassigned to something else, it's not malicious anymore. What's going on on this IP doesn't have anything to do with what happened before, and maybe now there's a website that people go intentionally. But still, it pretty, it's pretty tough to know when something is safe or not. So maybe we should distinguish two things. Live threads, you see something. The payload is, is here, I can download it, it's live, let's block it. Same for a live C2. But you can have some pretty old indicators. And in this case, maybe you should still trigger an alert so that you know that maybe this machine has been compromised, but think twice before blocking. So in the fight against botnet, we never talk about ISPs. Still, they have a pretty big role. They can take down infrastructures, and they can work with researchers and law enforcement. So there's a new sample out or a new campaign, and this is what happens. So people come across it, researchers come across it, they talk about it, then you can see some references to it on Twitter and on kernel mode and other forums, and people keep talking about it, and there are some VT comments about it, and security vendors start to block it. So everybody's aware of it. That's great, awesome. Even three, but what is that thing on the bottom right? Well, actually, this little green box is the ISP where the thing everybody is talking about is hosted. Nobody talks to it. Well, maybe after a while, somebody is gonna tell the ISP, "Hey, there's something wrong." Okay, nuked. Cool. All right, this happens. What happens next? 
people keep talking about it. Still there? Still dangerous? This guy is sad. <laughs> well, the thing is, even though the ISP took down something, this ISP is not going to get in touch with everybody saying, hey, this is what we did. No, it's too time consuming. Nobody's going to do that. So that's pretty sad. ISPs can answer a bunch of interesting questions. Like, there was something wrong? Is it fixed now? When was it fixed? Or was anything done after a report? And also an interesting thing is that like you come across IOCs in the report, an APT report, for example, from five years ago, and you can see that there's still something on this IP. And it's suspicious, like it's a 404 Nginx error page. That's suspicious. Well, is it still the same actor behind this IP? It can be a super interesting information, even for law enforcement. Still, today, there's no way to know about this kind of information. Another interesting thing, we often observe that whenever a server is serving something malicious, this is a new customer, or at least a new ac account. So if you're building reputation systems, you're probably using features such, such as when was the domain registered, traffic, things like that. If you can have such a feature, that could be super useful. You can improve your model. Still, only the ISP knows about that. Given a single IP, is this IP just uh, owned by one guy or shared by 200 different people? That's another different question, which can be super interesting, both for investigations and for improving your predictive models. So right now, if you want to answer these kind of questions, well, you have to find a point of contact. You have to send emails. You have to cross your fingers. You have to wait. It's really painful, right? It's just one-on-one -on -one communications. And this is not something you can automate. Let's fix this. So this is a proposal. This is a language. It's called DIP. This is a language to describe changes made by an ISP. Like this IP is not a sign anymore. This IP as a new customer. This IP was taken down. So these are observations. It's not about talking about incidents. We already have things such as ticks to describe incidents. This is about changes before and after an incident. So in order for it to get some traction, it has to export changes without ever disclosing personal customer information. Furthermore, this is a way to describe changes. So we have a set of events, but events must provide only facts. And feeds can be private or public. And it has to be super simple. Simple to understand, implement, and deploy. So once again, Stix is amazing, but first, it, it's XML. It's really tough to get started to write something new using Stix, so that people just use a very small subset, namely Cybox. DIP has been designed to be very, very simple. You can get started in 10 minutes. So this is a DIP event. It's made of a bunch of properties. This is a fixed set of properties. For a given version of DIP, you're going to have this set of properties, nothing less, nothing more. So each property has an ID, unique ID, nothing fancy, a timestamp. This is just a unique timestamp. And a bunch of different things. First, a type and a resource ID. So this is what we're talking about. Some change was made to what? to a domain, to a name server record, to a website, to a specific pass on a website, to an email, an IP, or a subnet. And you might be like, hey, something's missing. I want sample signatures and stuff. Nope. You already have tons of tools and protocols 
to store signatures and actors and campaigns and stuff like that. This is not a replacement for that. This is just to fill a small gap which is missing. So this is a fixed set of resource types for a given version of this language. And then we describe what happened to this IP, to this server, to this subnet, to this domain name. So one step you can get is assign, which means that we have a new customer. It doesn't mean that the previous one is gone or the previous ones are gone, just there's a new one. So if you have multiple customers behind a single IP, you're gonna have multiple events with this specific state. Now we can see reserved. Reserved means that it's gonna be used by the ISP itself. So this IP is not gonna be assigned to any customer. So if you see something bad, well, the ISP is shady. Unassigned, some customer had a specific IP, now it's not the case anymore, the IP is not gone, maybe we still have a bunch of owners for, for this IP, but there's one less. Suspended. So sometimes we find suspicious stuff. And we want to get in touch with the customer, either because we want some extra details, or we just want to give a chance to the customer to fix it quickly. So we just drop an email saying, hey, this is what we found. It's suspicious. Fix it. And if we get a response before 24 hours and it's OK, everything was fixed, looks clean now, we can restore the service. If we don't get any response, or if it's bullshit, we just take down the server. So this state means that the server is not taken down, we just block the traffic until we get some response from the customer. Resumed, all right, we got a response, all clean, ready to go again, we just unblock the traffic. Clean. This is typically to report false positives. So this is the ISP saying, hey, we reviewed this specific website, this specific IP. We didn't find anything. And maybe we reviewed it after seeing something in some blacklist, or maybe after you sent us something, and we think it's clean. So it doesn't mean that you have to whitelist this IP server or whatever when you see this kind of event. It's just a hint. It's just something you can consider. Like if you get uh, an email from a customer saying, hey, my website was compromised, it's not the case anymore, please unblock me, you can check what the ISP thinks. If you see that the ISP thinks that it's clean, all right, it's gonna wait in a little bit. So it's just an, an indicator that you can use. Notified. So in this case, everything is still up and running. But still, we know that something malicious was observed on this specific server, IP, domain, whatever. And we got in touch with the customer saying, hey, fix it. So if you know about something malicious and it's still live, it's still here, you can check whether the ISP actually did something or not. Even if you just open an abuse report and you don't see anything, well, you can still check that and you know if the ISP is doing something or not, and you can see when. So you don't know what exactly, you just know that the ISP did something and got in touch with the customer about the security problem. Cleaned, all right, it, it was malicious, it was compromised, whatever, it's not the case anymore, and the ISP itself says, I think it's safe now. My customer did everything, and now it's probably safe. Deleted. So I think this is the last state, and it doesn't exist anymore. So if you see this kind of event with an IP, it means that the IP doesn't belong to the ISP anymore. It was sold to a different company. This is something you see most of the time for domain names, but still it can be for subnets, IP, whatever. So it's not gonna be assigned to any customers anymore, not even to the ISP. So I've been talking about owners, so the only rule is that whenever the real owner changes, you have to change this value. So how to do that? Well, you can use real information from the customer. If you're cool with that, that's great. Probably not the case. 
Another thing you can do is use a unique ID. You probably already have one for your accounts. This is bad ID because you can see all the things a specific customer owns, and maybe this is something customers don't want to disclose. You can use a counter. That's a terrible idea in general. Why? Because you can estimate how many customers a specific ISP or reseller has, and it might not match your marketing numbers. So don't do that. So what I recommend is just use a permutation function or just some random ID. It's still important to have an ID, even if it's random, because you, you can use it to link this specific event to different systems, such as crits or whatever. And if you want to do that, link uh, some deep events with your system, well, you can use the very last property, which is just called related, and then you can insert everything, any kind of IDs. And if you have a private deep feed with someone selling or telling you constantly, hey, this is the kind of thing I found on your network a couple of days ago, please investigate. Well, you can send a specific ID, a ticket ID, or maybe a spe specific URL that was mentioned before. So this is a way to link things together. Now, ISPs can have resellers. And if every single reseller publishes their own feed, it's going to be kind of messy and you have to subscribe to everything. So what can be done is actually some kind of aggregation. So the ISP itself is going to consume deep feeds from resellers and publish everything as a single feed. So we have this property called depth, which is basically the number of hops this information is coming from. So when you emit a new event, the depth is always zero. When you consume an event, you just do a plus one on this depth. So we have two resellers, R1, R2, sending events to the ISP. And then this is the public feed that uh, anybody can consume. And you can see two events coming from resellers with a depth of one. And the last event was sent by the ISP itself. So you can assign different trust levels according to the number of hubs if you want to. But one thing an ISP can do is maybe double check or just confirm things. Like you have a reseller, and this reseller tells you, hey, I just took down this specific server. Well, the ISP can confirm that. OK, the IP is not used anymore. I can see that on the switch. So the ISP can lower the depth just as a way to say, hey, we double check this. Even if it comes from a reseller, now you can assign the same trust level to this specific event as a trust level you assign to us. So feeds are decentralized. So every single ISP can have their own feed, private and or public. And then you can choose, all right, I trust this ISP. I'm going to consume the feed. And same thing for ISPs. ISP can consume feeds from resellers they trust. And if something goes wrong with one of them, like this guy is constantly saying, hey, it's a false positive, it's a false positive, but nope, it's still live, it's still bad, you can just stop consuming a feed. So deep events are just key values, super simple. So you can use pretty much any standard format protobuf, even CSV. Remember, the set of keys is fixed. So that's super convenient, super easy to implement. But we recommend that all implementations support at least JSON. Fair enough. What about transport? Well, taxi is a good candidate. Taxi is great. Well, usually taxi is used with XML because of sticks, but it works equally well with JSON. So you can use taxi. Or you can use any queuing mechanism. But the minimum we recommend implementation to implement is server sent events, which is just HTTP with a very simple format. This is very easy to implement, both server side and client side. So this is a bare minimum we recommend for any, uh, any deep implementation. 
Let's take a look at some examples. So a subnet was assigned to somebody else. So we can see two events. The first event has a reference to a previous owner. So we had a, an assigned event before with the same owner ID. And then we see an assigned. And right after this event, we have the timestamp right here. This specific subnet is not owned by anyone, by the ISP, but it's not used anymore. And then later on, you can see a new owner owning this specific subnet. So two events, pretty simple. This is a response to a phishing report. This is in four parts. So the first event is about a specific pass on a specific domain, on a specific website. And as you can see, what the ISP did is not take down the server, but part of the traffic was blocked. A specific URL was blocked. But the website itself is still live. So you can see when it happened. And then the file itself was removed. You can see deleted. So the website is still there. Everything else on the same domain is still up and running, but this specific web page doesn't exist anymore. After a while, the ISP reviewed the website itself. There was more crap of, on it. So the website itself was taken down. And then the domain name itself was removed. So you can see four different events because everything doesn't happen at the same time. And in addition to that, having four events is super useful because you might be looking for just one specific event. Maybe you're just interested in domain name changes. So you can just look for one event. So let's see a different example. This is a response to a spam report. So this is a response to a private email or a private feed. And you can see a link to whatever reference we had in the email. And you can see notified. So at this time, nothing really happened. From a user perspective, the server is still up and running. Nothing was changed. But you can see that the ISP got in touch with the customer to tell, hey, we got a spam report. And then uh, what you can see is clean. It wasn't a spam. It was a marketing campaign. It was totally legitimate. So you can see a different event. Last example. This is a response to a compromised server run by a reseller. So you have a first event sent by the reseller about a specific URL. Yes, this is WordPress. And a reference to a sticks observable. And the reseller says, hey, now it's clean. I took to the customer. Everything was reinstalled from scratch. Now it's clean. And then you can see exactly the same event, but the depth is zero. So the ISP reviewed that, double-checked everything, and yes, it's clean. And that was about a specific pass on example.com. But then the whole website was reviewed and was found to be clean as well. So this is not about the domain name. This is about the website. When you see vhost, this is a website only. So maybe there is something wrong on the domain name still. What was reviewed is only the website here. So that's cool. Everybody can consume this kind of feed learn a lot about what ISPs are doing. But sometimes you want to answer some different questions. Like, when was this IP assigned to the current owner? Well, if you want to answer this, you have to replay everything. You have to store everything in a database. It's not really convenient, right? How many incidents were reported and addressed on this website in a given time frame? Same thing. You have to be constantly retrieving the feed, storing everything to answer this question. Well, you can do that. Of course, you can. It's the same subnet shared by many customers. This is a way to spot CDNs. Well, same thing. You have to observe everything to know how many customers we have on a single IP. So in order to do so, well, you have to write some code 
actually storing everything. And in order to get you started, there is an implementation. So it's still a prototype. It's called Eris. So it provides a HTTP-based API to answer this kind of questions. So you can use it to send queries, such as, hey, I got this IP. I want to know the state of this IP at a given point in time. Who owns it? Who, who owns it? Since when? And you can also get some intelligence. Given a uh, time frame, you can see all what happened. Try to sign, unassigned, and then the owner was notified about something wrong. So this is a very easy way to answer the previous questions. So why DIP? Well, DIP is a way to learn about what ISPs are doing. Can be very, very useful to researchers, law enforcement, because you learn about things immediately. You don't have to wait and contact people. You can do it as a second step. And if you report something, you can check if the ISP is actually doing something or not. For ISPs, one of the first things I learned is that it's really, really easy to get into a blacklist. It's really tough to get out of blacklist. Sometimes you just send an email, you never get any answer. Sometimes you don't have any point of contact. Sometimes you just get a response that says, hey, it's just automated. Cool. So it's a way for ISPs to tell to just everybody, this is what we did. We think this is a false positive. Do whatever you want with this information, but we just publish it publicly. And for customers, you can see what ISPs are doing, which might be nothing. Or you can see that, OK, this ISP has a lot of badness, but they're pretty reactive. They do something. So if you want to discuss this protocol, if you want to implement it, if you want to change it, if you have ideas, check out this website. It's going to be online right after the talk. And it's on GitHub, so the, there is a file with a specification. So feel free to open tickets and pull requests to change it. And hopefully, it's going to get some traction. And it's going to be great for everybody. And thank you so much for your attention. Now we have some time for questions. And one of the questions can be, can you make a quick demo? Thank you. Um, we have only one minute, so uh, I, I suggest you make the demo, okay? Okay. And you ask questions later tonight. All right, that works. So a demo of an API is not super fun. Can you guys read? All right, so this is a demo of Eris. So this is the HTTP-based API to answer the questions I described previously. So let's see, this is just a random IP. And you can see the state of this IP right now. So let me scroll down a little bit. So you can see that we have something like five owners right now, which doesn't mean that in the past we had more owners. And actually, you can see that we had, since this IP has been assigned, 11 owners. But there are five active right now. So what this piece of software is actually doing is replaying all the events, combining everything, and then you get some summary. So this is just given a specific IP. You can add some constraints. Like, I want to see everything that happened after a specific time frame. Oops. So OK, let's do this. Try out. All right, so you can see that a few things happened. This IP was unassigned, so one less customer on it, a, a new customer, and so on and so forth since this specific date. We can perform lookups on some nets, and maybe we're going to see the same IP. Let's see the whole, maybe it's when, slash 24. And I want to see everything since the beginning. All right, so you can see what happened. And we can look for specific events. Like, I want to know when this thing was suspended and when maybe the customer was notified. 
just to see if this IP or this subnet is likely to be shady or not. So I can see this event, and you can see all the notifications made to customers on this specific subnet. And you can do a bunch of other things, such as count how many customers you have, even for just a specific time period, and stuff like that. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Enjoy the conference. <laughs>